Kushi joins a goddess dormitory and claps them. Kushi Nagumo's just a 12-year-old kid. One day, when he got back from school, his house was on fire and guess what? It was his dad who started it. But instead of sticking around to sort things out, Kushi's dad, well, he ran away, leaving Kushi all by himself. So there he was, this 12-year-old Kushi, all alone and homeless. He wandered around the city of thorns, trying to make sense of things. Life was tough, especially for a kid like him. No home, no food, nada. One day, he was so hungry that he just passed out right there in the middle of the street. Lucky for him, this college girl with green hair named Minoru showed up. She told him she was a researcher. Minoru could see that Kushi was in a real pickle, so she took him to her place, her dormitory. And let me tell you, she whipped up a tasty meal for him. Kushi couldn't believe his luck. After gobbling down his grub, he was feeling pretty good. Minoru told him he could use the bathroom to freshen up. Kushi was thrilled, and he sprinted to the bathroom. But when he swung the door open, surprise. There were three girls in there, Serene, Kiria, and Frey. They lived in the same dorm as Minoru. Kushi was beyond embarrassed. He beat a hasty retreat out of there. But then, bam, he bumped into Atina, a girl with pink hair, who was also part of the dorm crew. They had a little collision and ended up on the ground, and Kushi's face. Well, it was in a rather awkward spot. Atina, she got a nosebleed and fainted right then and there. The other three girls, they couldn't believe how quick Kushi was to end up in such a situation. On that very first day, Kushi got to meet the gang from the goddess dormitory at the women's university. There's Minoru, a big shot fourth year student who's holding down the fort as the temporary dorm supervisor. Then, there's Kiria, a tough cookie in her second year who's been into martial arts since forever. Frey, she's a third year student, and she's all about cosplaying and making snazzy costumes. Atina, she's a fresh first year student. And here's the kicker, she's got this thing where she only talks to girls and gets nosebleeds around guys. Last but not least, Serene, the quiet one who's been on Earth so long. She can't even remember when she got here. She's kinda quirky too. After a bit, Kushi spills the beans to the girls about his tough situation. Atina's still in her room, recovering from her little nosebleed incident. Kushi lays it all out, no money, no family, and no place to crash. He tells them he's itching to go back to school, but the cash situation's got him stuck. That's when Minoru steps up with a brilliant idea. She suggests they hire him as the dorm supervisor since they didn't have one officially. Kushi's eyes light up when he hears this plan. He's all in, no second thoughts. He's ready to jump on board and start working right away. The other girls are on board too. They'd love to have an official supervisor to help out. There's just one little hiccup, Atina. Her room's the next stop for the news. They're hoping she'll change her tune once she hears Kushi's story. But boy, did they get a surprise. Atina's not having it. She's putting her foot down real hard. See, she's always been surrounded by girls ever since she was a wee thing. All girl schools, all women family, the whole deal. She ain't about to change that now. If Kushi's gonna work there, she's making a run for it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Kushi's scratching his head, trying to figure out why Atina's so dead set against it. She packs up her stuff and bolts out the door while the rest just watch her go. Minoru filled Kushi in on Atina's situation. You see, Atina had never really hung out with boys before. The first time she did, it was a bit of an accident. She walked in on her roommate and her boyfriend clapping. That was enough to make her feel all weird inside. She got a nosebleed and passed out. Ever since then, she's been super uneasy around guys. Minoru, thinking she could help Atina get over her fear, decided to hire a boy as a supervisor. But here's the thing, it didn't work. Atina got even more scared, and nothing got better. Kushi, even though he couldn't wrap his head around why Atina was so scared, didn't want to take someone else's home away. He knew what it was like to be without a place to stay and going hungry. So, he dashed after Atina as she was walking away. He caught up with her and had a chat. He convinced her to head back to the dorm. After all, it was her home. He promised he'd figure something out for himself. Atina went back to the dorm, but Kushi, he was back on the streets again. He turned down a job that could have given him a home and put him back in school, all because he didn't want Atina to suffer. His life stayed tough. He found a spot in the park to crash for the night, all cold and alone. While Atina was heading back to the dorm, she remembered what Minoru had said about Kushi's house burning down. It hit her right in the feels. She realized Kushi was a real selfless guy, giving up a chance for a better life just so Atina didn't have to be homeless. And lucky for Kushi, who had nodded off in the park, Atina showed up to rescue him. She hoisted him on her back and took him back to the dorm. When he woke up, he felt her warmth and caught a whiff of her pleasant scent. As Kushi reached out his hand, he accidentally touched something. 
turns out, it was Atina's plot armor. And just like that, Atina got a nosebleed and passed out right there. So, now Kushi had to carry her back to the dorm. But here's the twist, Atina, she finally accepted Kushi working there. She was trying to be brave and help Kushi out too. The very next day, Kushi was all excited to start his new job. But guess what? The dorm was a total mess except for Atina's room, which was spotless. Kushi decided to start cleaning up Minoru's room first. He knocked on her door and guess what she was wearing? Just a shirt that showed a bit more than it should. Kushi's face turned as red as a tomato when he saw that and asked her why she's dressed like that. Minoru told him it was for convenience, like, it helped her work better or something. Kushi, all flustered, said he'd wait outside until she was done changing and quickly walked away. But then, out of nowhere, a hand reached out and yanked Kushi into Frey's room as he was passing by. Frey, she's all about cosplaying, and she saw a golden chance to dress Kushi up. She insisted he try on this maid uniform thing because it was part of the job, you know. She didn't mind helping anyone, boy or girl, find the right outfit. While he's stuck in that maid outfit, Frey springs another request on Kushi. She wants him to measure her plot armor's three important stats. He couldn't really say no, it was part of the job, right? But man, he was so uncomfortable and red as a tomato. As he was trying to do this awkward task, he accidentally lost his balance and tumbled. And guess what? Frey tumbled right on top of him. Right in the middle of this mess, Minoru busts into the room like lightning. She's in a major hurry and tells everyone to get out of the dorm a SAP. Something had gone really wrong with one of her experiments, and toxic gas was taking over the place. All three of them dash outside, and Kushi's super worried. He realizes that these girls, they're usually all chill about stuff, like, they don't think about what happens next. So, he gives them a little lecture about being more careful. But then, he realizes maybe he was a bit too harsh since they're older than him. So, he says sorry real quick before hightailing it out of there. Minoru, she actually appreciated it. She thought Kushi was pretty responsible for calling her out on her actions. She gave him some respect for that. Kushi's still strolling down the street in Frey's maid getup, and let's just say he's getting quite the attention. But he's a pro at this street life, and he manages to score a blanket for the girls. See, it's cold outside, and both Minoru and Frey were in no shape to deal with the chilly weather. That blanket came in handy while they waited for the gas mess to clear up. As the only boy and kinda like the dorm mom, Kushi felt like it was his job to keep the girls safe and warm. But then, out of the blue, Frey and Minoru come rushing up and give him a big all hug. Seems innocent, right? Well, not quite. Unfortunately, Atina saw this whole scene go down, and that caused her to have one of her famous nosebleeds and faint right there on the spot. Late at night, Kushi was sleeping all peacefully when he got jolted awake by some crazy noise coming from above his room. It was like someone stomping on the ceiling, you know. And then, whoa. The ceiling just gave up the ghost, and guess who came crashing through? It was Kyria, and she got stuck, like, couldn't climb back up or anything. So, her only choice was to crash down into Kushi's room. Kushi, being the good guy he is, tried to help break her fall. He rushed over to her, but here's where things got super awkward. They, like, collided in midair, and Kyria ended up landing right on top of him. Now, Kushi's all puzzled and stuff, but he's had something like this happen before, so he starts looking around. And guess what he spots nearby? It's a book, and Kyria's trying to hide it, looking all shy and stuff. Turns out, that book was super special to her. It was the very first book she bought when she started at the university. Back then, she had no idea there was a whole sweet and bright world waiting for her in those pages. See, she'd grown up in her family's dojo always fighting and stuff. So, when she got her hands on that romance book, it made her feel all soft inside, and she got totally sucked into it. But here's the kicker, when she was reading, sometimes she'd get so worked up and emotional that she'd, like, lunge at the wall and punch it, you know, just to let out all that pent-up feeling. In that moment, Kushi figures out why Kiria broke the ceiling. She's a shy girl who's all into mushy romance books and sometimes punches stuff when she's super emotional. Kiria says sorry for the hole and asks if she can sleep in Kushi's room cause she's afraid she might fall through her own ceiling. Kushi's kinda wondering why she's cool with sharing a room with a boy, but then he gets it. She's used to it cause she's got little brothers back home. So, Kushi's like, alright, we can share. But when the lights go out, Kiria tries to have a deep chat with him. She tells him that whenever she looks at him, she thinks about her younger siblings she used to spar with in the dojo. Kushi's just trying to sleep, but Kiria misses her sparring sessions with her bros so much that she goes all out and attacks him, like they're in a big fight. 
It gets so wild he thinks he's in some serious danger, but he doesn't get too hung up on it cause he's realized the girls in the dorm are a special bunch. They've all got their own styles, and they're all pretty. So, he tells Kyria, even though he reminds her of her siblings, he's just a regular boy. He hopes she gets that. Right after saying that, Kushi feels all embarrassed and runs out of the room, leaving it to Kyria to sleep there. He arranges to sleep in Kyria's room instead. Kyria, she's feeling a little shy cause, you know, that was the first time anyone called her cute. But Kushi's not thinking about cute stuff. Nope, he's worrying that Kyria might turn his room into a disaster zone, just like she did with hers. He hopes that won't happen. While Kushi's catching some sleep, Serene sneaks into the room. She's there to see Kyria about some job thing. But surprise, she finds Kushi instead. She spots the hole in the floor and makes a deal with him. If he agrees to be her servant, she'll use her moon tech to fix that hole. Kushi's only half awake, so he's like, sure, sounds good. He doesn't really get what's happening. But hey, if it means getting his room back and Kyria back in hers, he's in. Then, out of nowhere, Serene gets close and claps him under the moonlight. After that, she goes over to the window where the moon's shining and kinda looks like a white rabbit. The next day, Kushi wakes up, and guess what? The floor is all magically fixed. He's totally clueless about what happened, but he doesn't mind too much. He heads off to make breakfast cause, you know, he's the dorm supervisor, and he's gotta feed everyone. And wow, they're all super impressed cause the food he makes is, like, crazy delicious. The girls are super happy cause Kushi whipped up some yummy grub for them, and they want to thank him. Minoru's like, try this medicine I whipped up. Frey's all about her outfit and wants him to wear it, and Kiri is itching to spar with him after they chow down. Atina, though, she's surprised cause Kushi's gotten all buddy-buddy with the girls real quick, especially since he just started working here. She's wondering if there's something shady going on while she was away. And what's even crazier, Kushi's even won over Serene, who she'd never think would warm up to someone new. It seems fishy. So, after breakfast, they put Kushi in charge of cooking and handling the grocery money. But Atina's still not convinced. She can't wrap her head around how they trust Kushi so fast. When Kushi's gotta go grocery shopping for dinner, Atina's like, I'm coming too. She wants to see if he's really trustworthy. She's not letting her guard down till she finds out the truth. Problem is, Atina's scared of boys, so they've gotta take all these back streets. After some tricky moments, they manage to get all the dinner stuff they need. Kushi was pretty amazed at how brave Atina was for facing her fear of boys head on. Most people would just avoid it, but she didn't, and that made him happy. He felt this kindness and courage from her not just now, but all day since he came to the dorm. He was super grateful to her cause her welcoming attitude let him stay there. Atina, on the other hand, is thinking that maybe Kushi forgave her for leaving that day, and that's why she's been more open lately. She's realizing that's probably how Kushi gained the trust of all the girls. As they're walking, they accidentally bump into two guys, and Atina's about to have a nosebleed cause she's so scared. But Kushi's quick. He's like, she's my sister. And he whisks her away from the guys. So, they decide to take a breather in a nearby cafe. Atina's not saying much, but Kushi starts by saying sorry for how he carried her earlier. Surprisingly, Atina's not mad at all. In fact, she's like, call me sis again. She keeps asking, so Kushi's like, alright, sis. And she gets super excited, like she really loves being called sis and wants to hear it in all sorts of ways. Atina's feeling all comfy thinking of Kushi as her little brother. She stands up and says she wants to protect him from now on. But oops, her dress slips off by accident, and she's super embarrassed. She tries to put it back on but slips and falls right onto Kushi's face. And guess what? She faints from a nosebleed. After a bit, they head back, and Kushi says sorry for causing trouble and thanks Atina for going to the store with him. Atina's like, no need for thanks. At first, she had doubts about him, but now she believes he's earned the girl's trust through how he treats them. She wants to do something for him and be his big sister. Back at the dorm, Atina's talking to the others about it when Minoru walks in and tries to flirt with Kushi. Atina's like, nope, not happening. Now, she's all set on watching out for him and treating him like her little brother. And when the others hear Kushi call Atina sis, they all want him to call them the same way. Two weeks have zoomed by since Kushi moved into the dorm. The place is now buzzing with life. Kushi's doing his job like a champ. He's even earned Minoru's trust enough to do her laundry, which kinda makes him blush at first, but he goes ahead and does it. But after doing all this, he realizes he hasn't even been to school since orientation day. Man, he misses his friends. So, after making breakfast, he gathers everyone downstairs. But before Atina comes down, she lays down a condition. Kushi has to call her sis. He does it, and she's super happy when she shows up. 
She's even about to pat his head to show her gratitude, but then she remembers she's scared of boys. She tries really hard to get close to him without freaking out, and Kushi can't help but notice that her plot armor is like right in his face. While he's thinking about that, Frey sneaks up from behind and catches him looking. She starts teasing him about liking Atina's outfit, which is kinda like her sleepwear top. Frey even jokes about designing a see-through outfit for him. Atina quickly steps in, determined to protect Kushi from any more teasing, even though she was the one who wanted him to call her sis so bad. And Minoru notices what's going on too. Kiria steps in, wanting to be a big sister too because she already has a little brother. They start arguing about it and decide to have a contest to see who should rightfully be Kusha's sis. After breakfast, the competition begins. Frey goes first and tries to show her sisterly love by dressing Kushi in a pink outfit. Kushi's like, why am I wearing girl clothes? But for Frey, cuteness is all that matters. She even says little brothers are like their sister's playthings, but Kushi strongly disagrees. Frey gets disqualified real quick. Next is Minoru. She wants to prove she's a good sister, so she asks Kushi to test one of her concoctions. Usually, little brothers make great test subjects, but not this time. Minoru is also disqualified right away. Then it's Serene's turn. Everyone's curious to see what she'll do since she usually doesn't do much. She just lies on the floor and rests her head on Kushi's lap, like a pet would, not like a sister. Finally, Kiria steps up. She knows how to handle this contest because she has a younger brother at home. It's almost too easy for her. She shows her affection by playfully attacking him and eventually makes him pass out. Atina gets concerned when she sees Kushi lying on the floor and checks on him. She wakes him up and acts more like a mother than a sister, reassuring him. The other girls tease Atina because she's leaning over Kushi, making it look like she's about to feed him like a baby. When Atina turns to talk to the girls, Kushi wakes up and accidentally grabs her clothes, causing her to have a nosebleed. After the chaos settles down and Kushi takes a bath, everyone comes to apologize for causing trouble. Despite the chaos, Kushi is starting to understand what having an older sister feels like, and he's okay with it. The girls are happy that Kushi sees them as his older sisters. Minoru announces that after Golden Week ends, Kushi can go back to school. She and Frey have taken care of the paperwork for him. The Golden Week ends, and the next day, Kushi returns to school. He's excited because he finally has his own shoe cabinet. But suddenly, a girl kicks him in the face. This girl is Sudia, his childhood friend and classmate with a quick temper. She knew about his house burning down and was worried about him. She asks him why he didn't send her a message to let her know he was okay. At first, it seems like she wants to tell him she was worried. But then she changes her attitude and claims she wasn't concerned at all. She quickly leaves, feeling conflicted about how she treats him. She genuinely cares about him but can't express it properly. Whenever Kushi tries to be friendly with her, she brushes him off, and this upsets her. Kushi knows his friend well and isn't easily deterred by her cold behavior. He plans to talk to her and share about his house burning down and finding a new place to live, but he won't reveal everything due to his new sister's eccentric behavior, fearing she might misunderstand. Kushi tries to stop Sudia by reaching out his hand, but she gets really mad and scolds him for touching her hand. She leaves, and Kushi realizes she's upset because he forgot about her condition. Sudia's body is super sensitive to high temperatures, whether it's warmth from things, the hot weather, or even people's body heat. It makes her feel uncomfortable, dizzy, and she can even faint if it gets too bad. This is how they became friends when they were little in kindergarten. Back then, while all the other kids played in the sun, Sudia sat in the shade all alone. Kushi noticed her and asked her to play, but she said no because she was afraid of getting dizzy. So, Kushi took her hand to invite her again, but the warmth from his hand made her feel uncomfortable and anxious. She told him about her condition, and he understood right away. Kushi rushed inside and grabbed an ice pack to cool his hands down. If his hands were cold, it would be okay for them to hold hands. Sudia thought his hands would warm up quickly, which annoyed her, and she pushed him away. But then he touched her face with his cool hands, and it calmed her down. That memory of Kushi's cool touch stayed with her while she sat alone on the rooftop, eating her lunch. Sudia can't figure out why her reactions always seem different from how she really feels. But Kushi was persistent and never gave up on her. While she's thinking about this, she starts to feel dizzy because she's sitting in the sun now that the shade has moved. Suddenly, Kushi appears and gently puts his cold hands on her cheeks, surprising her. She realizes he never forgot about her condition and he shows her the ice packs in her bag. He even asked Minoru for help to make sure he could keep her cool whenever she needed it. He was always thinking about her. Then, he starts telling her everything. Later, after he finishes his story, Sudia wants to see the dormitory for herself. 
but as she tries to get up, she feels dizzy and staggers, losing her balance. They both stumble and fall on a bed, and it looks kind of indecent. Anyone who saw them might misunderstand. Tushi tries to get up, but Sudia stops him. Surprisingly, she wants him to stay close, but before she can finish her sentence, her attitude changes again and she pushes him off the bed, hiding her true feelings once more. Sudia didn't mean to slip and push him off, but it happened, and she's not happy with herself about it. In the afternoon after school, she still wants to visit the dormitory with him to do an inspection, but Kushi doesn't think it's necessary. Seeing that he doesn't want her to visit, Sudia wonders if he feels guilty about something. If there's nothing to hide, then there's no reason to be afraid. When they arrive at the dormitory, an explosion goes off because one of Minoru's experiments failed again. Both Minoru and Frey run out to save themselves from the toxic gas. Sudia sees them in their natural state and is left speechless. When the house is safe to enter again, everyone steps inside. Kushi introduces the girls to Sudia. Then, Atina arrives, and she gets her own introduction. Kushi adds that Atina is the only normal one in the house. Spotting Sudia, Frey is struck by her cuteness. She wants to give her a makeover and makes a move to do so. However, Sudia, sensitive to body heat because of her condition, is swiftly protected by Kushi. He quickly explains Sudia's condition to Frey. Feeling embarrassed because Kushi is defending her, Sudia kicks him away. She blushes and turns away, regretting her impulsive reaction. The dorm girls notice her embarrassment and find it amusing. It's clear that Sudia has feelings for Kushi, and they playfully suggest that Atina now has a rival for Kushi's attention. Atina tries to explain, but no one pays much attention. Later, Sudia decides to inspect the dorm to see if it's suitable for Kushi. First stop, Kushi's room. It appears quite ordinary, so Sudia doesn't feel too cautious. Atina, never having seen his room before, is quite curious. Witnessing Kushi and Atina having an intimate conversation, Sudia feels a pang of jealousy, though she doesn't voice it. Onto the second room, Minoru's. It's filled with toxic gas from her experiments, making it impossible to enter. Seeing this room reminds Sudia of the rumors circulating around the school about the poisoner of the women's university. She becomes wary of the dorm's condition. They proceed to Frey's room, where there's an outfit that seems perfect for Sudia. Frey eagerly helps Sudia change into it, and the scene catches Kushi's attention. He quickly averts his eyes. Frey's enthusiasm gets a bit over the top, prompting Atina to step in as Kushi's self-proclaimed older sis. Next up is Atina's room. It looks pretty regular, so Sudia starts feeling less cautious and relaxes a bit. Kushi, for the first time, takes a close look at Atina's room, which he's never seen before. It's cozy, and it smells nice. When he compliments Atina on how well she's kept it, she blushes. Sudia notices this and instantly becomes wary again. Then comes Kiria's room, packed with romance books. Kushi and Atina are surprised that Sudia has let her guard down so much around Kiria. But things change when Kiria begins reading a book right in front of Sudia. Just as usual, Kiria can't contain her excitement and punches the wall, setting off alarms in Sudia's head. She concludes that this dormitory is extremely risky for Kushi. Seeing Sudia's discomfort, Serene offers her a piece of cake. But when she remembers correctly, she realizes that the cake has gone bad, adding to the dorm's perilous reputation. It's getting late, and everyone wants to make up for their mistakes, so they decide to have Sudia stay overnight. They'll all live together under one roof, but the big question is whose room Sudia will choose. Since all the other rooms seem dangerous, Sudia picks Atina's room. As she goes in to prepare for bed, she keeps giving Atina stern looks. However, this is Atina's chance to make amends with Sudia. She assures Sudia that this will be a memorable night for her. Soon, she starts asking about Kushi's past and what kind of person he is, since Sudia has always been by his side. Atina is quite sure he's a kind and dependable person. On the other hand, Sudia has one question for Atina, what's everyone's relationship with Kushi? Atina was caught off guard by the question. Just as she was about to explain, they suddenly heard Kushi screaming. They hurried downstairs to check on him and found him trying to clap Kiria. They tried to explain what happened. While Kushi was taking a bath, he started feeling dizzy. He decided to finish and when he came out, he accidentally bumped into Kiria, who was heading for a bath herself. And that's how they ended up in this awkward situation. Kiria had already showered earlier, but since she was practicing martial arts by her bed, she got sweaty. She wanted to take a bath and accidentally ran into Kushi. Sudia was super shocked and asked Kiria directly what was going on, making Atina blush. Kiria looked around for a moment and blushed too. 
It should have been nothing. But Sudia found it weird that the girls were blushing even though they were older than Kushi. She thought it was unfair, especially when no one could explain why. Sudia ran back to her room upset. Several days passed, and Kiria and Atina acted distant and less lively. They even forgot to bring lunch to school because they wanted to avoid Kushi. Frey got suspicious of their behavior and asked what happened between the three of them. Although Kushi realized it might be related to what happened the night Sudia stayed over, he didn't say anything. Frey mentioned that the girls would go hungry because they didn't have money to buy lunch, and they wouldn't get their allowances until the next day. Kushi couldn't figure out how they would manage without money, and their class schedule meant they wouldn't be home until late in the afternoon. Missing lunch was not an option. Frey suggested that Kushi should just bring them lunch to school. Frey worried because it was an all-girls school, and he wasn't sure if Kushi could get in as a boy. So, Kushi had to dress up like a girl to enter the school. Kushi agreed and went to the school in his girl disguise. As soon as he entered, all the girls noticed him. They thought he was cute and wondered whose little sister he was. Two older students eventually figured out he was actually a boy, but they didn't seem to care. They wanted to hang out with him and have some fun. They stuck around him, but he managed to slip away and find a Tina, who was in economics class. Just as he turned a corner, he accidentally bumped into the two older students again. They were excited to be talking to a boy, which drew even more girls' attention, and they surrounded him, making it hard for him to escape. Luckily, Atina came out and saw him in that situation, and he was in high demand. To stop the girls from bothering him, she quickly pulled him away. Kushi explained everything about the lunch situation to Atina, and mentioned he brought lunch for Kiria too. Atina then led him to Kiria's location. As Atina walked without looking where she was going, she accidentally bumped into Kiria, who was carrying a bucket of water. They both ended up getting wet and had to change their clothes. Kushi decided to wait outside. The two older students from earlier followed him to that spot. When they saw this, Atina decided to let him stay inside. Since he was dressed as a girl, he was Atina's little sister for the moment, so there was no need to be embarrassed, but he still turned away. Kiria lent Atina some of her clothes since Atina didn't have any to change into. However, even though they were nice clothes, they didn't fit Atina well in the bust area. After they finished changing, Kushi looked at them and was quite shocked to see Atina in Kiria's small shirt. The shirt was so tight that a button popped off and hit him in the face. This caused him to have a nosebleed, and Atina also got a nosebleed and fainted. They all made it back to the dormitory, and there, the girls comforted Atina for her condition. Minoru and Frey felt relieved to see that Atina and Kiria were less tense than they were in the morning, but they didn't quite understand why they felt that way. Finally, Minoru decided to have a talk with them about their behavior towards Kushi, who had been worried about them. Atina responded that there was nothing to worry about and quickly suggested a trip she had been thinking about for a while. She wanted Kushi to invite Sudia to come along if possible. As they all discussed the trip, Serene started acting strangely. She hurried upstairs, which concerned the girls, especially Atina, who had come up with the idea. However, they assured her that the plan was perfect and that they'd have a great time. Minoru told Kushi to do his duty as a supervisor and go talk to Serene. Kushi went to Serene's room, but since he'd never been in it before, he didn't know what to expect. When he opened the door, he found that it was dark and filled with clutter. Serene was nowhere to be seen. As he stepped in, a cabinet toppled over, knocking Serene onto him. He wondered why she kept so much stuff in her room and offered to clean it up right away if she wanted. However, Serene explained to him that it wasn't clutter, everything in there was a collection of tools that harnessed technology from the moon to absorb its power. He couldn't quite understand what she was talking about, but when she mentioned the moon, he remembered the night Serene had entered his room and clapped him. He had thought it was a dream, but now he knew it wasn't. He asked her if she had also visited Kiria's room that night. She didn't deny it, confirming that it truly wasn't a dream. Serene knew he had come to talk about the trip. She didn't disagree with the idea, but her activities were limited to the dorm and the school. She had never stepped outside that area, so she was quite anxious. She said that the moon's power was strong in this region, bringing a sense of tranquility for her livelihood. Kushi didn't quite understand, but he wanted to help her so that they could all go on the trip. He went to share everything with everyone, and they all started looking for a solution to Serene's problem. Now, they needed to find something that Serene could consider a part of her to act as a safe zone, something she could bring on the trip but still feel at home. Kushi had an idea that maybe it could be something from the moon or something similar. Everyone joined forces to create a mobile safe zone for Serene. The next day at school, Kushi saw Sudia walking to school. She was struggling because of the hot sun and her condition. 
It was already summer and the heat was intense. Everyone was dressed for the weather, and Sudia looked lovely in her summer uniform. Kushi was mesmerized by her, but he quickly noticed that she was getting dizzy. He took out two ice packs and placed them on Sudia's face to help her cool down. When they got to school, Kushi invited Sudia to join the group for the trip, and she agreed, but she wanted to supervise it, not to have fun. She wanted to make sure that nothing suspicious or inappropriate happened. Back at home, Frey had designed a special outfit related to the moon. She went to show it to Serene, and it was a Sailor Moon cosplay costume. Just the thought of Serene cosplaying in it excited Frey. However, for Serene, wearing a cosplay outfit in public went against her sense of modesty. Even though this disappointed Frey, Serene agreed with her. Minoru came up with another idea. She had aged a potent moonlight sake that could help Serene leave her room and join the trip without any problem. All Serene had to do was take a whiff of it, and it would tempt her immediately. She wouldn't be able to resist. Unfortunately, Minoru accidentally revealed Frey's plot armor to the sake, and Frey became intoxicated, losing control of her actions. Minoru had no choice but to deal with the situation she had created. Later that evening, when Kushi returned home, he found Kiria and Serene practicing a Tai Chi technique involving yin and yang. It related to the vastness of the universe, and since the moon is part of the universe, Kiria hoped that this practice would help Serene with her power. However, Serene's essence was tied to the moon, making the immense power of the universe almost overwhelming for her. She stopped practicing and collapsed to the floor. Frey stepped out wearing the Sailor Moon costume she had for Serene, and Minoru joined in the fun with her own costume. Atina arrived and gave Serene a special umbrella. On the inside, it was painted to look like the moon and stars at night. When Serene opened it, she saw the pattern and showed how much she liked it. She agreed to go on the trip with everyone. After dinner, when Serene retreated to her room, Kushi quickly returned her jacket to her. He had taken it while doing laundry and noticed that some seams were coming apart, so he fixed it. He had noticed her always wearing it and thought it must bring her peace, just like the moon. Serene had been worried about the unraveled seams, which might have caused her feelings of unease, as the jacket was crucial to her. She was happy that he had fixed it. The next day, the group set off on their trip. When they saw the sea in the distance, they got excited, thinking they might be going to the beach. However, the car passed by, leaving them puzzled about where they were heading as they went toward the mountains. It turned out that Atina had mistakenly booked a place on top of a mountain. She felt upset with herself, especially because the place looked haunted and unwelcoming. But since they had already paid a deposit, they couldn't change locations, so they had to stay for the night. That evening, they all went to a hot spring. Minoru asked Atina why she came up with the idea for a vacation because she usually kept to herself. Atina explained that she wanted to make up for the night Sudia had stayed over at the dorm. After some time, Minoru and Frey decided to climb the wall to check on Kushi, who was in the hot spring all by himself while the girls were together. They were worried that he might be feeling lonely, so they wanted to sneak a peek at him. When they got there, Kushi was flustered by their sudden presence. They seemed disappointed that he didn't try to peep at them. To calm him down, they showed him that they had towels on, so he had nothing to worry about. They suggested that they all sleep in the same room so that Kushi wouldn't be lonely anymore. Unfortunately, Minoru's towel slipped down, but Atina was there to make sure Kushi didn't see Minoru's plot armor's hidden stat. Then, Frey accidentally dropped Atina's, which kind of defeated Atina's efforts to protect Kushi. Seeing all this, Kushi had a nosebleed and fainted in the bathtub. When he woke up, he found everyone sleeping around him with their plot armor stats exposed, and he found it hard to sleep at all. Eventually, he noticed Atina leaving the room, and he decided to follow her. Minoru followed him too. Since Atina had been gone for a while, Kushi and Minoru started getting worried. They searched all over the house but couldn't find her anywhere. The only place they hadn't checked was the other creepy part of the place, which was temporarily closed. They decided to check the creepy part, and as they both walked in, they felt the space expanding around them. Kushi looked around and started to feel a bit scared. He wanted to hold Minoru's hand, but when he reached for her, she had vanished. Now he was even more frightened because he was all alone. However, Minoru returned and held his hand. She admitted to being scared too, and he vowed to protect her as the dorm supervisor. But she told him that she would be the one protecting him as the older sister because they weren't at the dorm at the moment. She said this as she leaned over to him, making him blush. He ran away to wash his face, and on the way, he saw Atina coming out of another room. She was looking for the bathroom but had no idea where she was. While they tried to find their way back, they saw a white figure that looked like it could be a ghost. Atina grabbed Kushi's hand and pulled him away from there. They took shelter in another dark room, 
and suddenly, Atina approached him slowly, prepared to clap him. She told him that she would protect him. Kushi never expected Atina to be so bold, and he froze in place, not sure what to do. Just then, the lights got turned on, and Minoru walked in, asking Atina why she was assaulting Kushi. This embarrassed both Kushi and Atina. Serene walked in with Minoru, revealing that she was the ghost Atina and Kushi had seen earlier. The next morning, everyone prepared to leave. Kushi apologized to Serene for thinking she was a ghost the previous night. Frey wasn't satisfied with the trip yet, so they all decided to head down to the beach to have some fun and play. Beach time was a lot of fun, and the girls played ball together in the water. Sudia wanted to join them, but she felt self-conscious because everyone else had higher stats plot armor, which she also wished for. She glanced over at Kushi, who was sitting in the shade, watching over the girls through his binoculars. He said he was doing it because he was their dorm supervisor, but when Sudia looked at him, she couldn't help but wonder if he was admiring their insane plot armor. When she looked at herself and compared her low stat plot armor, she felt like she didn't stand a chance. From the looks of it, Kushi probably preferred a plot armor with more offensive stats like the other girls had. Kushi was so focused on his duty that he didn't notice when Sudia went into the water to swim by herself. Some fish started to surround her, and she tried to get away from them. But a mischievous fish managed to get inside her armor, making her flustered and unable to swim properly. She ended up falling into the water. Luckily, Kushi was still keeping an eye on them with his binoculars, and he quickly noticed when Sudia started to struggle. He rushed over to try to help her, but since he couldn't swim, he asked Kiria to come and save her. After the incident in the water, Kushi went to check on Sudia, but she got upset with him, telling him it wasn't his concern. Kiria explained that Kushi had been very concerned about her, and he was the first to notice that something was wrong. He jumped straight in to help, and when he realized he couldn't swim, he asked for Kiria's help. But Kiria said that even if Kushi hadn't asked for help, she would have done the same. Sudia was delighted by this because she realized that he still cared about her and had been paying attention to her too. Everyone discussed how surprised they were to find out that Kushi couldn't swim, but they still thought he was helpful since he was the first to notice, and, in a way, he did save Sudia. Atina told him that he should be proud of himself for his heroic deed, saying swimming isn't everything. At that moment, Kushi decided to take a break and go buy something to drink. He wondered why he suddenly had a warm feeling in his chest at the thought of Atina's compliment. He didn't understand it, but it bothered him. Since the weather was quite hot, Kiria put ice packs on Sudia's face. These had been prepared specifically for Sudia, which Kiria thought was a thoughtful thing for Kushi to do. This made Kiria a little jealous as she wondered what it would be like to be that close to Kushi, and how they used to be when they were growing up. Sudia apologized to Kiria for her behavior the night she stayed at the dorm and thanked her for saving her life. Frey asked Sudia about her long hairstyle during the hot seasons because it might be uncomfortable with her condition. Sudia shyly whispered something to Kiria, and Kiria shared with the others that Sudia kept her hair long because Kushi's first crush was on their preschool teacher, who had the same hairstyle. She wanted to appeal to what he liked, even though she never really expressed it to him directly. Frey and Minoru were surprised by Sudia's innocence and cuteness. Frey got so excited that she immediately lunged at Sudia and hugged her, which made Sudia even more uncomfortable until she fainted. Atina got worried and quickly ran to buy a snow cone for her. As Kushi was returning to where everyone was, he saw Atina being harassed by two guys who insisted that she join them for a swim. They were holding her hand even when she refused. Kushi quickly stepped in and pushed one of the guy's hands away, telling them that they shouldn't force a girl into a situation she wasn't comfortable with. The two guys looked down on him and asked if he was her boyfriend. Atina told them that he was her little brother, and Kushi said he was her supervisor. Kushi took Atina's hand and led her away from the two guys who were bothering her. When they were at a safe distance, he quickly apologized to Atina for grabbing her hand. But Atina didn't mind much because Kushi was different from other boys. He was like a member of her family, a little brother. After that, they went back to where everyone else was, but Kushi still felt bothered by the heavy feeling in his heart. While Atina was taking a shower later on, Sudia joined her and apologized for her previous behavior. She explained that she had resented Atina for no good reason because she believed Atina was never there for Kushi when Atina and the others were there for him during his darkest times. Atina shared that she felt the same way as Sudia did. She wanted to protect Kushi, but he always ended up protecting her, and it was Frey and Minoru who helped him with school. Atina revealed that the reason she suggested the trip was to do something for him too. She saw the similarities between her and Sudia's situations, and without thinking, Kushi had agreed right away. 
as they headed back home. Sudia felt assured that she had nothing to worry about. Atina was just Kushi's older sister. She looked back to see Kushi, who seemed a bit down as he stopped and admired the sunset over the sea. The next day, Kushi seemed distant. He got jumpy when Frey hugged him while he was cooking, and she pointed out that he was so distracted that the pot on the stove was boiling over. After breakfast, Atina offered to help him wash the dishes, but he refused without even looking at her. Frey noticed this change in his mood and wondered how she could cheer him up. She thought cosplay might be the best way, so she took him to a cosplaying studio. At the studio, they changed into popular game characters. Frey cosplayed as the commander of a knight order, and Kushi cosplayed as a knight in the same order. Their characters were also in-laws, with the younger brother in love with the older sister, but the older sister only saw the younger brother as family. In their play, they had to fight each other because their objectives were different. Frey took her role seriously and stayed in character, asking Kushi a series of questions that he had to truthfully answer without hesitation. As they fought, Frey asked him about what had been bothering him, and after a little hesitation, he finally recounted the events at the beach. He told her that someone close to him had said they felt safe next to him, as if he was family. Normally, Kushi would be happy to hear that someone felt safe around him, but things were completely different now. Ever since these strange feelings had arisen, he always tried not to think about them. He wanted to stay with everyone and believed that acknowledging these feelings might jeopardize his current relationships. He didn't want everyone to hate him. Frey compared his situation to the character he was cosplaying and urged him to be his true self because he had been hinting at it since he arrived. But Kushi was more focused on having a warm home and a family that cared about him, like the one he had with his friends at the dorm. Frey hugged him and shared her past with him. She used to be straightforward and blunt, which often came off as rude and caused misunderstandings. So, when she came to live at the dorm, she hid her true self to avoid hurting them. But one day, everyone at the dormitory found out about her true self, and she had to embrace reality. Even if there were arguments or if they didn't like her for it, she wouldn't run away from her mistakes like she did before. She hoped that in doing so, she might even find a different kind of love than what she knew. After confiding in each other, they headed back to the dormitory. Today is the Women's University Festival, and Kushi and Sudia decide to go and check out what everyone is up to. The festival is open to everyone, including boys and children. As they step into the festival, they bump into Frey, who is part of the committee organizing the event, and is in charge of providing costumes to some departments. She knows the campus inside out and offers to give them a tour to show them the best places. Their first stop is an unofficial drugstore hidden behind the school. It's not on the official festival map, so not many people visit it. Minoru, the owner, sells homemade medicine to make some money. The place looks a bit shady, just like Minoru's room, and it's unclear if the medicine is safe to use. Minoru proudly shows the three visitors her two most confident potions. The first one is an aphrodisiac stimulant, and the second one is a love potion. Both of these are banned from the school, but Minoru keeps making them every year. Another campus committee member stumbles upon Minoru, and she quickly packs up and leaves. In her rush, she accidentally drops a bottle of medicine into Kushi's bag. Afterward, Frey takes the two kids to check out a paranormal research club that claims to have found a mysterious creature in the school. They've been investigating this creature, but they haven't figured out what it's called or what it does, so they just call it a legend. Frey mentions that Serene is part of the presentation, but in reality, Serene is the mysterious being they're investigating. Another club member rushes in and reports that Serene has been spotted near the refreshment stand. Concerned that Serene might be subjected to experiments, the three of them hurry to save her. When they reach the courtyard, they find many girls there engaging in mischievous behavior, playing around. Kushi spots a bottle of one of Minoru's medicines on the ground and realizes what might have happened. A girl with glasses approaches him, feeling like she's seen him before, and he's about to deny it when Frey suddenly puts a wig on him. It's the same wig he once wore when he pretended to be a girl on campus, leaving him puzzled by her actions. The fumes from the medicine start spreading around, and they reach Frey, affecting her too. Many of the affected girls rush toward Kushi, showing an intense desire to clap him. Sudia tries to intervene when she sees the harassment, but then the girls shift their attention to her instead. In that critical moment, Serene suddenly appears wearing black glasses and taps into her enhanced moon power. She radiates a bright yellow light that blinds everyone around and cleanses the area of the strange effects of Minoru's medicine. Everyone quickly regains their senses, but Serene collapses on the ground due to exhaustion. Kushi rushes to her side, helping her up, and together they make their way to the medical room. Meanwhile, Frey and Sudia head out to buy some food, hoping it will help Serene recover temporarily. 
While they're in the medical room, Serene tells Kushi that food alone won't be enough to fully restore her strength. The best way for her to recover completely is through direct contact with her servant, which means an intensive clapping session. Kushi's mind races back to the night Serene visited him in Kiria's room, and he can't help but feel embarrassed about how to act around her, considering they've clapped before. Serene reassures him that he's not the only one she has this kind of contract with. In fact, almost everyone at the dorm is her servant in one way or another. As she slowly leans in, prepared to clap, Kushi suddenly falls backward in his chair as Frey and Sudia enter the room. Serene's attention quickly shifts to the food they've brought, as it reminds her of the galaxy. After their eventful day, Frey realizes they still have some time left and decides to take Kushi and Sudia to visit Atina at her workplace, a cafe. Atina is working there to get to know other guys besides Kushi, and she's dressed in a maid outfit. As she steps out in her uniform, all eyes in the cafe turn to Atina, causing her to blush. She tries hard not to have a nosebleed and faint like she usually does. Frey, Kushi, and Sudia enter the cafe as guests and watch Atina in action. Kushi is impressed by her professionalism, and Sudia is fascinated by the maid outfit. When their food is served, a mishap occurs, and Atina trips, falling onto Kushi's face. Thankfully, Sudia manages to save the food from disaster. Atina apologizes in a manner befitting a genuine maid, leaving Kushi feeling awkward and unsure of how to respond. Meanwhile, at another table, some guys ask Atina to spend time with them, perhaps show them around the campus. While she's struggling to prevent a nosebleed, she politely declines their offer. Observing this interaction, Kushi is about to rush to her defense, but Frey stops him. She explains to Kushi that Atina is actively making an effort to interact with other boys, and the best way he can support her is by letting her do her best while he watches from a distance. Frey hints that Atina may be doing this for someone special, like Kushi himself. Atina retreats to the kitchen to catch her breath after the encounter. Her co-worker notices Kushi and asks if she's doing all of this for him. While it's a bit awkward for her to admit her true intentions, Atina eventually accepts when her co-worker encourages her to spend time with Kushi. She wonders who will take her place to balance the cafe's staff, and to everyone's surprise, Frey volunteers Sudia to be the new maid replacement. Sudia eagerly embraces the opportunity and adopts the role of a tsundere maid. With some free time on their hands, Kushi and Atina decide to visit a location where there's a cross-dressing competition. One of the judges turns out to be Kiria herself. She's really popular among the girls because of her coolness and charm, and even Atina seems charmed by her. The place is packed with people, and Kushi starts to feel hot, so he takes out a drink to cool down. However, after finishing the drink, he realizes that it isn't water. When he reads a few lines on the label, he learns that it's one of Minoru's medicines, which is meant to bring out the true personality of the person who drinks it. After the competition, Kiria meets up with Kushi and Atina and thanks them for coming to support her. She has an extra ticket to a labyrinth tour and invites Kushi and Atina. Atina tries to decline the invitation because of her classroom responsibilities, but Kushi blurts out that he wants to try it in a kid-like fashion. Atina ends up agreeing to join them, and they all go on the tour together. Whether it's due to the medicine or not, Kushi is expressing emotions that match his age, which Atina likes. She wants him to act like this more often. The labyrinth is scary and dark, which scares Kiria and Kushi. Atina seems more fearless, so Kiria and Kushi often cling to each other to overcome the labyrinth and make it out of there. Kushi still acts like a protective little brother, even when he's acting more childlike. Kiria holds his hand and tells him that she feels safe with him around, and so does Atina. As they walk, they end up at a dark place where they see nothing but darkness, and they stumble and fall. When the lights come back on, Kushi finds himself lying on top of Atina and Kiria and claps them. Later, they return to the cafe, and Kushi gives Minoru the empty bottle of the medicine he drank. He tells her that he drank it by accident. Minoru asks him how it was, and he tells her that he said some incredibly unbelievable things that were out of character and embarrassing while under the influence of it. So, Minoru reveals that what he drank was not medicine but purified water. She did it on purpose to see how he would react. The foolish things he has said and done from noon until now were of his own free will. The cafe started to become quite lively after Sudia took over Atina's place. Her customer service skills were top-notch if you would like that kind of service. Suddenly, Serene rushes in, being chased by members of the Paranormal Research Club. The disciplinary committee also rushes in to capture Minoru. And because of Minoru's potion, the girls in the school start to chase after Kiria. The scene at this moment became nothing but chaotic. On another day at the dorm, Kiria gets a call from her family, and they tell her there's a problem at home. 
Kiryu's family owns a martial arts dojo, especially for kids, and they have a Christmas party every year. But this year, her family can't make it, so Kiryu has to go home and handle the party all by herself. She's a bit down about it because it's a big job, but it's a family tradition, so she feels she has to do it. When Atina hears about this, she offers to help. She sees it as a chance to put into practice what she's learned from her family economics and early childhood education classes. Kushi also has some free time, so he decides to assist Kiria. They plan to go shopping for the supplies they'll need later. Before they head out for shopping, Kushi's assigned household chore is to clean the bathroom. But when he opens the bathroom door, he's surprised to find Atina just getting out of the bath. He's embarrassed and quickly shuts his eyes, apologizing for not knocking. Atina apologizes too for using the bath at that moment and tries to hurry out. But in her rush, she trips and falls on top of Kushi. Because she's not dressed, she gets a nosebleed and faints. So when it's time to go shopping, Atina doesn't have the energy to join Kushi and Kiria. Seeing Kushi and Kiria going shopping alone, Minoru playfully teases them, saying they look like they're going on a date. Kiria, feeling a bit awkward, punches the door and quickly heads outside. Kushi follows her, and soon they reach the supermarket. Inside, they notice many other couples shopping together. Kiria is actually happy to be spending time with Kushi like this. They get to visit different places and attractions throughout the day, just the two of them. After a while, they decide to take a break at a cafe. Kiria feels a bit shy, almost like they're on a date. But to others, they look more like siblings. They continue shopping together as they had planned. Usually, as Christmas approaches, Kiria's dad dresses up as Santa Claus. But this year, since Kiria is taking on the role, she doesn't want to wear boys' clothes for it. They decide to ask Frey to make a special Santa outfit just for Kiria. Kiria also thinks Atina would look really cute in these outfits, even cuter than herself. She believes she has more of a boyish look, despite being cool during school festivals. Kushi suggests that Kiria should wear these cute outfits more often, and she seems open to the idea. When they return home, they ask Frey to create the outfits, which requires taking measurements. Frey is about to measure Kiria, and since Santa needs a reindeer, Kushi tries to make a quick exit, but Frey stops him. Frey proceeds to measure Kiria, and although Kushi closes his eyes to avoid any awkwardness, the process seems to take a while. To avoid any further awkwardness, he decides to go outside. Their plan for the day is to visit Kiria's hometown. However, when Kushi returns inside, he accidentally sees Atina taking a bath once again, which means she can't join them once again. At that moment, Serene appears, talking continuously about the moon and how to harness its powers to fix the door that Kiria ruined earlier. Seeing an opportunity, Kiria asks for Serene's help and offers her a package of cookies in exchange. With everything settled, the three of them board the train to Kiria's hometown, and after a half day of travel, they arrive. Upon entering the martial arts dojo, a group of small kids surround them and get introduced to Kushi and Serene. They get taken to change clothes, and as a result, both Kushi and Serene have to join the class together. They take the judo class together, and after the kids finish their practice, it's Kushi's turn to train with Kiria. During this time, their faces get quite close, and Kiria accidentally throws him down in embarrassment. Later, they start getting ready for the Christmas party. Before Santa Claus arrives, they all have to decorate the place, and the kids receive special badges for good behavior. However, most of the kids are more interested in getting gifts rather than badges. Kushi notices a girl sitting alone in a corner and decides to approach her and start a conversation. She wonders if only well-behaved kids can receive presents, and she confesses that she always feels like the weakest in her class, which makes her believe she doesn't deserve to receive a gift. She lacks the confidence to participate with the others, and hearing this, Kushi can understand her feelings. He clarifies that the badges he made aren't about skills, they are meant for those who put in their best effort. As long as she attends the classes and doesn't slack off, Santa would come to her too. After spending some time decorating, two cute and charming Santa girls enter the room. Kiria's little brother is surprised to see his sister dressed in a Santa outfit, having abandoned shorts completely. He only recognizes her after getting hit, realizing it was indeed his sister. Once the gift distribution is over, it's time for the main event, riding on the reindeer as Santa. Kiria's little brother asks his sister to ride on Kushi's back. Despite some initial hesitation, Kushi allows Serene to go first. Serene gets on his back, causing him to feel a warm sensation. As he suspected, she isn't wearing anything underneath, so he hurriedly takes her to the changing room to put on clothes. By the time they are finished, it's late in the evening, and Kushi sits down to admire the moon. Kiria comes over and sits close to him, 
and both of their faces start turning red. Kyria moves closer to him, and just as they are about to do something, Serene appears, having been eating cake the whole time. Winter arrives, and the weather is quite cold. Minoru and Frey have prepared a heater. It's Kushi's first time using it, so he's quite excited. Kyria wants to sit next to him, and Atina's jealous expression is obvious. They play a game of tapping each other's feet when it comes to sitting by the heater. Under the table, no one can see what's happening, so they kick wherever they want. Frey even places her foot in an inappropriate spot on Kushi. Everyone gets involved, and it gets quite chaotic. Nobody knows whose foot is whose. Kushi realizes that everyone is creating a comfortable atmosphere, allowing him to feel the most relaxed. He might have always wished to be like this with his family. However, his old home had burned down. Atina wants to console him, but Minoru beats her to it. At Kiria's house, they often sit with her younger siblings to study, and as a result, everyone ends up falling asleep right there, studying in front of the heater and doing homework with friends. Looking back, Kushi has never done anything like that before. Atina is about to invite him to study together, but Minoru suggests bringing Sudia over first. The next day, he invites Sudia to the dormitory. He pleaded so many times because she kept refusing due to her condition. But eventually, she agrees on the condition that he buys her ice cream. Later, he brings Sudia to the dormitory. When they enter, there is no one around. He is quite surprised that no one is using the heater. Normally, Serene would spend all her time buried under that table. If there's no one there, both of them can focus on their studies. While doing their assignments, Kushi almost falls asleep. As for Sudia, she falls asleep completely. The temptation is too strong for Kushi, so he lies down and falls asleep. Sudia wakes up because it's too hot and is about to scold him. She realizes that he's already asleep. Since he hasn't started his assignment, Sudia helps him with it and turns off the heater. Since she turned off the heater, Kushi feels quite cold. He tries to hide deep inside and accidentally kicks Sudia's private spot. His leg keeps shaking, and Sudia enjoys it. Unexpectedly, Atina sees this scene making Sudia freak out and throw the heater on Kushi. There's a big cosplay event later, and Frey has to participate. She says bye to Kushi and leaves for it. Kushi decides to clean up the dormitory, and Frey asks him to tidy her room before she leaves. She says it's not that messy, but when he enters, it's actually quite chaotic. Seeing that, Atina helps him. While cleaning, they hear a noise from Serene's room. The room seems about to explode. Atina rushes out and sees Serene hanging onto the windowsill. When Serene slips, Kushi quickly rushes to catch her, and thanks to his quick reaction, Serene lands safely. The room is quite dangerous now, and there's even some liquid spilling out. Atina tries once again to see if the door can be opened. Just then, Sudia appears. He's relieved that Sudia arrived just in time. Since Frey had to attend an event, Kiria is having an end-of-year party. Minoru is in the lab. He's happy that Sudia came. Atina is jealous because he didn't compliment her much, despite her being the first to help him. All three of them start cleaning together. They go to clean Serene's room after dealing with Frey's. Serene doesn't want them to, she protests. She's the first member of the dorm. And in over a year, the others start coming to live there too. Kushi and Sudia also started coming over more often. And within just a year, the dormitory has become more joyful. Instead of neglecting a quirky person like Serene, everyone started caring about her. But they still need to tidy up the room. They decide to visit Minoru's room first and find that she's upgraded it into a lab with a decontamination area. Kushi likes it very much, but Minoru tells them that they will get a tour another day. They go back to Serene's room, and Atina uses snacks to get her to agree to let them clean it. They find many valuable things that Serene keeps which isn't trash like they had initially thought. Minoru finds liquor, and gets drunk. She tries to persuade Atina to drink with her. Just by smelling it, Atina knows it's strong liquor. Even just smelling it makes her drunk. As Kushi and Sudia clean, they run out of ties to bundle the things in there. Kushi goes outside to look for them. Stepping out of the room, he sees the three girls are already drunk. Minoru and Serene lean on him to sleep. Atina doesn't want to be left out, so she joins in too. When drunk, Atina always speaks her mind. She asks why he keeps thinking about Sudia all the time. She can't understand why it's not her who he thinks about, she also wants his attention. Before she finishes speaking, she falls asleep. Now Kushi is in a quite dangerous situation. Before he can enjoy much, Sudia finds him, and he gets scolded by her. The new year is coming soon, and Kushi is curious about everyone's plans. Minoru intends to stay at the dormitory because she's more focused on research than partying. 
Tyria also plans to stay because she already visited her home during Christmas, and if she goes back now, she'll be busy with her younger siblings. Serene doesn't reveal her plans, simply saying it's not a big deal, so she's staying too. Atina has similar plans. All of this makes him realize that he's quite content. He agrees with the sentiment. Welcoming the new year with everyone is something he didn't anticipate. After losing his home due to the fire, he never thought he would reach the end of the year in such a warm and connected place as the dormitory, with everyone feeling like family. Hearing this, Minoru decides to throw a memorable New Year's party. However, he needs to buy ingredients for cooking, and going alone isn't ideal, so Minoru asks Atina to accompany him. But Atina is occupied with something else, so Kiria steps in to go shopping with him. Atina stays behind to complete a New Year's gift for him, and he and Kiria head to the supermarket to purchase the ingredients. Kiria wonders whether girls should know how to cook, and suddenly, Kushi collapses on the floor. Atina, who has just finished the gift, rushes in after Kiria reports that he fell in the supermarket. Frey hears the news and rushes back home, wanting to hug him tightly but Atina stops her due to his illness. They check his temperature and discover he has a high fever. They start discussing how to treat his cold, emphasizing the importance of rest, good food, and a sexy nurse, which they believe is vital for his recovery. Upon hearing this, Frey immediately dresses up as a nurse, and Kiria prepares some apple juice for him. Serene finds the situation amusing and brings more fruits to help. Kiria is about to cut open a durian, but they stop her. Sudia also rushes over upon hearing about his illness. She checks him thoroughly and uses her forehead to gauge his temperature. After taking his temperature, she presses her face against his, causing her to feel embarrassed and fall on him. Sudia faints, so Minoru and Atina take her and leave to rest in another room. As they depart, Frey somehow ends up on Kushi's bed. Atina, hearing a strange noise, turns back and sees Frey acting seductively toward him. She intervenes to ensure his well-being. However, she slips, falls onto him, her clothes come off, and she starts bleeding from the nose before fainting. To give him a chance to rest, Frey and Kiria carry Atina out of the room. Now that he has rested, they divide the household chores. After a brief rest, he's feeling somewhat better. When he steps outside his room, he bumps into Kiria, who is doing laundry and offers to wash the clothes he's wearing. However, as she's about to smell them, she decides against it. Due to the unique care he received from Frey and Serene, he had run out of his room without clothes, so Kiria helps him find something to wear. But the clothes got torn, leaving him wearing shorts and a small t-shirt. Atina wants to make a meal for him, but there are no eggs left in the fridge. Serene, curious about the inside of an egg, smashed and ate them all. She thought they resembled the moon. Minoru advises Atina to use her new experimental seasoning, which she obviously refuses. But Minoru insists, and while struggling, they accidentally drop the seasoning into the food, causing an explosion. Minoru and Atina's clothes also change color and state. Witnessing this, Kushi starts having a running fever again. From morning until now, his fever hasn't subsided. Local clinics are all closed for the holidays, so they need to take turns caring for him diligently. Atina earnestly asks to stay and nurse him. She tends to him throughout the night, but his fever doesn't decrease. Kushi calls Atina's name. He holds his hand and reminisces about their encounters, from their first meeting to the present. Gradually, he falls asleep. The next morning, when he wakes up, Atina was lying on him. He realizes she has cared for him all night. After recovering from his illness, he resumes his work. Atina also presents him with a handmade gift, a pair of gloves. Remembering that tonight is New Year's Eve, he needs to go shopping and invites Atina to accompany him, which she readily agrees to. Everyone else decides to join as well. How could they let Atina have all the fun? Just then, Sudia arrives, and they all set out together. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.